Proglacial lakes. What are the proglacial lakes? Where they form? Why we see them and some glaciers and some glaciers we don't have them? Let's discuss how they form, what's happening with them in the future, and maybe impact for us, for people from this type of lakes. If you've been long enough on this planet, you probably remember that many glaciers, for example, around South America, North America or, or New Zealand, where we have more temperate climate condition, the glaciers changed drastically. If you've seen the glaciers around New Zealand pre-1990s, you probably remember them differently. We have numerous photographs, sketches, paintings, which show us that the glaciers look different. And we're not just talking about glaciers going up the valley, retreating, living in the open valleys, full of polished rocks, streams and sediment, but we're talking about formation of the lakes. I was lucky enough to hear comments from people who are far from geology. Oh, look, there is a huge lake instead of the glacier right now. There is no more glacier left. There was the comment in front of the Tasman Glacier, the biggest glacier in New Zealand. No, the glacier is still there. This is the biggest glacier in our country. So people not quite understand what they actually see in front of them. Therefore, let's talk about that in detail. Proglacial lakes are the temporary lakes. They can be formed from different processes. By damming action of moraine. Moraine is the deposit in front of the glacier terminus or the end point. Uh, just a bunch of rocks that have been pushed and fall from the top of the glacier and build like a little ridge. And when the glaciers start retreating more drastically, so without any increasing its growth and going down the valley, just retreating down or up the valley, more probably this moraine will stay there and the water will be accumulated behind this ridge of the moraine, forming the lake. Sometimes glacial ice works as a dam, damming the moraine. For example, a lot of glaciers in New Zealand or around the Tibetan Plateau that's melting down more than uh, retreating up the valley. Melting down, you can imagine each of those glaciers have at least 500 meters or even kilometer of ice going down the valley. And the glaciers start melting downwards towards the ground faster than upwards due to the cover on the surface. The cover on the surface, all these rocks, which are accumulated through the life of these glaciers from slopes, from down below and from the surface, exposed on its surface because the glacier melting down. And as a result, this material, if it's thick enough, start protecting the ice from melting fast rather than the clean ice. Therefore, there's a lot of water created, little ponds all around within the ice, and as a result, the lake formed. Eventually, this lake melted down till the ground, separating the main body of the glacier from this glacial ice dam, which protected by the debris, it might take a hundred or so years to melt down fully. This also could be the meltwater trapped against the ice sheet due to the isostatic depression of the crust around the ice, and that's another case of formation of temporal proglacial lake. These proglacial lakes are very common during the rapid melt, and they indicate on a fast increase of the temperature and retreat of glaciers. For example, at the end of the last ice age, which finishing now, Halfway through 10,000 years ago, we have large proglacial lakes spread all around the Northern Hemisphere, forming in front of the former big glaciers. So let's on example of New Zealand, Tasman Glacier, the biggest glacier in New Zealand for today, talk about this lake's formation and observe through our historical data how it's formed. Tasman Glacier, or Haupapa, is the largest glacier in New Zealand. And it's sitting just in the vicinity of the Mount Cook, the, the highest point in New Zealand. This glacier flows south and east towards the Mackenzie Basin from the main divide of the Southern Alps in New Zealand. Let's cover a big area, it's about 23 km length. 
and its thickness today may reach about 600 meters. However, it's very rapidly melting in a warming climate and this data might be already different. This glacier is still considered to be the biggest, although since 1990s it's been uh, melting more rapidly than before. This glacier is about 4 kilometers wide and 600 meters thick and cover about 100 square kilometers area. We know that that area is about 3,000 meters above the sea level and it's eastward from the main divine. Several tributary glaciers are flowing into the main current of the glacier. You can see by these bend lines where the glacier flows, meet each other and bring more material to the main trunk of the body of the glacier. You can see this uh, rocks, or we call debris material, exposed by ablation along its course. In the higher levels we still have more snow, snow cover, seasonal, and less material. The more you go down towards the sea level, down the valley, the more rocks exposed to the surface and at the end you see the majority of the lower trunk of the glacier is entirely rock covered. And that bit what people see could be confusing, it seems like it's just a sediment in the valley, although we know there's about 500 meters of ice underneath. And because of this insulation properties of the rocks, of the ice underneath, as we talked before, and it slows down the melting of this glacier, although it's still melting. There's a numerous rivers, caves within the ice underneath these rocks. It's very dangerous to walk on these rocks, they're constantly moving. There's a sharp rocks on surface which are unstable and you might fall into the crevice or little cave made by the melting water within the ice. So only with professional guidance go on this type of glaciers. We know the tributary glaciers are Rudolf Glacier, Forest Ross Glacier, Kaufman Glacier, Haast Glacier, Hochstetter Glacier and the Ball Glacier. Down toward the end of the glacier, it's met with a Murchison Glacier, Termini, Termini the end point position. Murchison coming from northeast and flows alongside the Tasman down the Mena Valley. In front of the Tasman right now you can see this large lake. It wasn't there before 1990. There's a river we call Tasman River flows out south down from this glacier. This is the main melt water from the glacier and it's meets the Hooker River which accumulate the waters from Hooker and Muller glaciers and together this big stream flows down into the Lake Bukaki. All this system met the Aitaki River and flows down to Pacific Ocean north of Omaru. This is one big system, Mackenzie country, which been used by New Zealanders to produce energy. So if you look on this image of changes since 1990 till 2000, at least on this picture, you can see how there was nothing there, no lake and then small, small, bigger and bigger and then dramatically increased in its size. There could be some ice underneath the lake, up the valley, however it's melting rapidly and we're not sure where is it. There's some research being done before in the bottom of the lake, people are finding some remnants of the ice. It might today be already melted away because we know the water works as the buffer of the heat and it's increased the melting rates of the ice. So the glacier was sitting in its termini where the river flows out, we call termini position, terminal moraine, that's the place where you go for look out when you are touristing going visiting this glacier. It's been there for a long time. We know for more than several hundreds the glacier was sitting in that position. And you can imagine if the glacier was sitting there for a long time, it's carrying a lot of rocks all the time, like on conveyor belt, it will build up the nice moraine. And that's exactly what's happened. In front of the glacier you see this little ridge, that's the moraine. Now that it's little, you would think it's going down under the sediment layer, several hundred meters. And in front we have huge outwash. Outwash, it's the material that's been brought by the fluvial action, been brought, sub-rounded rocks and rounded rocks. And they work as a buffer or additional dam to lock the lake. 
And then the glaciers start melting down more rapidly after 1990s because there wasn't enough material on the surface and the little ponds formed on the surface and some of them joined. And as I say, the melting accelerated from this effect of the water on the surface of the ice. The glacier doesn't flow much forward in that area anymore, although there's constantly new ice flowing from up the valley, and the glaciers start melting down, we call it down wasting. From 2000 to 2008, the glacier receded up the valley about 4 kilometers. We consider today that the glacier is very fast in melting, rather than even before. And it's melt up the valley from 5 to 800 meters every year. Some predicted that the lake will continue growing, and about in 10 years it will reach its maximum. There's a, some theories suggested that when the lake surface, the level of the surface of the lake, uh, will reach the point where the slope is going so rapidly up the valley with the ice sitting on it, then we again will see the exposed termini of the ice of the glacier, similar like you see on Franz Josef or Fox on the west side of the main divide. There will be a similar picture there in Tasman, and the lake will be there or in my discharge will just disappear eventually. There's a every year less and less water supply to this lake because there's less ice in the glacier and with the warming climate, we would expect that the lake will start shrinking unless there will be some catastrophic event when the lake might discharge down the valley. It's very common for this type of lakes to outburst, we call it outburst flood, when the moraine cannot hold it anymore or if the moraine was formed from ice as we talked about, ice eventually melted down and the lake breached through and flowed down the valley with a rapid speed numerous amount of water washing everything on the way, destroying everything down the valley. These events will cause bringing a lot of material, rocks, boulders, sediment, silts, and so on, and it will be catastrophic if there's any people down the valley. Sometimes we have the landslide falling down on the glacier or into the lake and cause this breach of the dammed lake. For example, in the winter, 8057, landslide of Serat Pangur in the Hunza Valley Karakara Mountain dammed back a lake approximately 10 kilometers long. The dam was breached six months later and released a large flood down the Indus River, causing loss of lives. There's a more than 110 meters of material silt were accumulated during this six month period of this after that event. This type of material will find all around Karakaram region where these glacial lake outburst floods are quite common. It may be not in our history, in our memory, we remember many cases, but if you look through the geological history, at least at the last thousand years, you will see a lot of evidence of these events happened. And the lake will disappear, might disappear, might re-establish again, or the glacier might just it up the valley without formation of these lakes again. So these lakes were called temporary lakes. Only then geologists can read the material left in the valley and reconstruct if these lakes were present there before. We know that these glacier proglacial lakes formed a lot during the last deglaciation and we find a lot of evidence in the valleys. For example, if we're moving down the valleys around Rakaia River, we see numerous materials deposited by the lakes and then some kind of event, material being mixed with the fluvial material in front of it, and again and again it was repeating since the glaciers were retreating down from the maximum position till today position. So we can tell that the Tasman Glacier and Tasman Lake formation, outwash bounding it, damming it, and the moraine formed as well, damming it. This is like a miniature scenario for what's happened on a bigger scale back in the past. For example, look at Pokaki Lake or Tekapo. There's a large lakes that left since the last glacial maximum, the position of the lakes, end of the lakes where the road going through, that's where the glaciers were there about 20,000 years ago. We see numerous terminal moraines are washbound at the back. So it's basically a similar story, but in a bigger scale, 
and in the last glacial maximum. I hope now you have idea what are proglacial lakes, how they formed. If you look all around New Zealand, on the west coast we have very steep, narrow valleys with material flowing very fast and the changes very fast and rarely the lakes form there. There's just no condition for that. Although some people say there used to be a lake in front of the Franz Josef Glacier, little pond which formed on some stage. On the east side of the main divide in New Zealand we have more preferable conditions to form this type of lake. So the glaciers are bigger by themselves and they occupy more bigger valleys which open up down the hill and the glacier sits there and then melting down a lot of material accumulated on the surface forming these surface little ponds which eventually join into big proglacial lakes. Also the exposition of the slopes and the damming of the material in front of the glacier so the material is not removed as fast causing the natural dams forming which preferable for formation of the lakes. When next time you go for the trip to Mount Cook area, look around, you see the Miller Glacier big lake, you see the Hooker Glacier large lake, you see the Tasman large lake. It's the classical examples of these lake formations. And there will always be people who remember prior to 1990, there was none of those lakes existing. Where you're standing on the viewpoint right now will be the point where the ice was just there. We'll come back to the lakes, problems, climate change, potential hazard for us, for people, in the future videos. Please like, comment and subscribe to my channel so we can share this knowledge with more people.